On the 4th of March 2017, South Africa lost one of its national treasures. Margaret Roberts helped thousands of South Africans to rediscover good health. Fondly known as the Lavender Lady and the Herb Lady, we chose to call her the Plant Whisperer. Margaret Roberts was regarded as South Africa's foremost authority on herbs and healing plants. She was a devout Christian who dedicated her life to helping others. Her knowledge was unmatched, and although she had written over 40 books, much of her accumulated knowledge was still in her head. She was greatly concerned that when she passed on, much of that knowledge and experience would be lost. I think from day one, Margaret was a healer. She, as a young girl, uh, always displayed a great interest in caring for others, which I think is something to do with understanding others and also their, their holistic needs, of which one part is, um, is the health so, and the healing. So I think she, she, she attracted people to her, even as a child, who needed assistance and she was a great comforter and I think the plants became the vehicle that she used. Margaret Roberts was born in Johannesburg on the 1st of July 1937 and moved with her parents to Pretoria when she was four years old. She attended Brooklyn Primary School and then Pretoria Girls High where she was a prefect in her matric year. Growing up with Margaret was an adventure each moment of life. Um, there's a 10 year age gap between us, so she was my mentor, my protector, my inspirer, and my particular storyteller. Margaret's daughter, Sandy, has worked closely with her mother for the past 32 years. She too is an accomplished creator of beautiful things and believes both she and Margaret inherited these artistic talents from her grandmother. My gran was a wonderful artist, especially for flowers. Uh, and she, she would notice all the flowers and have every one named and in little bottles on her desk at a very young age. Margaret grew up with flowers and planting and the rituals of the garden and the seasons and also the uh, sort of periods of moon and sunshine and the mood of rain and the mood of uh, growing the season into our lives. So it was an interwoven process. We, I think we spent more time outdoors really than indoors. Mom was brought up to ask questions and to wonder why and to have a great reverence for the beauty around her. And, that, and not so much the beauty in other people, she accepted that, but the beauty in the world and the beauty of possibility and she used to talk about her green heritage and so forth. She studied physiotherapy at the University of Pretoria and then practiced as a qualified physiotherapist at Johannesburg Hospital and later in private practice until her marriage to Hugh Roberts in 1961. When Margaret married and uh, became a farmer's wife, she, the first thing she did was grow the most amazing vegetable garden. So when we had lettuces and all those different shades of lettuces, the dark ones and so on, she, she was the first person, I'm sure, in the country who had them. Her son, Peter, was born in 1963 and soon after fell seriously ill. Margaret took him to doctor after doctor and still his condition worsened. She was desperate. So mum made a bargain with God and said, if you save my son, I will help people for always after, no matter what they need, I will help them. And so with this bargain that she'd made, she found the strength within herself to be able to continue and to change her way of thinking around his diet and help him with the herbs. And in that, she helped many other people too. Over the next few years, daughters Gail and Sandy joined the family, 
growing up on a diet of healthy vegetables and herbs, organically grown in their own garden. She had a very strong sense of right and wrong and how to do things the right way and she lived her life in a very clear-cut way, you know. You did your homework because you promised you would, <laughs> you know. You'd eat the proper food because food is medicine. And if it doesn't taste that good, what's that got to do with it, darling? <laughs> but she would try and make it obviously all those things. Medicinal herbs became her passion, including our own African herbs. One of her earliest books, Indigenous Healing Plants, became a bestseller, illustrated with her own botanical drawings. A few months before she passed away, we asked Margaret about those early days on her husband's farm. In my years of working with medical herbalism, I found that my back stoop on the distant farm became almost like a clinic because people came from far and wide and they weren't able to reach the city and they were not able to reach the churches. And when I showed them how they could use simple plants like Balbinella or this common Carpobrotus edulis, which is called Hortnots fay, how they could use those to treat thrush, burns for their children, scratches and grazes. They took those plants to give to their churches. And that was so interesting because many of them didn't have church. It was merely a gathering where they sang hymns and read from the Bible, but they brought those herbs to share, the faith herbs, I call those. By the early 1980s, Margaret was honoring her bargain with God helping hundreds of local people to heal their ailments without the use of allopathic medicines. Then in 1982, her world was turned upside down when her marriage ended. Shocked, frightened and desperately alone, she had to start all over again. After her divorce, Margaret and her young children were in crisis. She often said that it was only her unwavering faith in God that gave her the strength to go on. With the help of friends, she moved to a small farm at the foothills of a mountain near the Hartebeersport Dam. The early days of the Herbal Centre were very challenging. Margaret came to a piece of land that was really barren. There were very few buildings, in fact there were only storerooms and chicken runs that were worth anything on the farm and with her bare hands she started building walls and little walls around the garden and pathways. This she started more than 36 years ago. We had these dreams of how we were going to uh, put the herbal centre together and where we were going to go. She originally started the herbal centre in mind having the plants be the educational tool for everybody to learn from. But what evolved was so much more than that. And it became product and it became cosmetics and it became food and it, it just evolved and evolved. Herbs are just like that. Herbs have a way of sucking you in and teaching you the most amazing things, whether it's one herb that you start off with a little garden or with, with an avenue of, of herbs. And this is how she had envisaged it for herself and for other people. The Herbal Centre is now regarded as one of the finest medicinal plant gardens in the country, a regular destination for people seeking alternative healing paths. Many of the plants here are rare and not to be seen in any other garden in South Africa and every one is grown for a purpose. This is truly nature's medicine chest, a place where every corner of the garden offers promise and hope to those who have found no cure from the expensive and often harmful allopathic medicines. In this natural ecosystem, insect pests and predators exist in perfect proportion. Diseases cannot flourish because Margaret understood the value of companion planting, grouping plants together that act as natural controllers of pests and diseases. But for Margaret, the journey was not an easy one. She faced many challenges that tested her faith. She was attacked and beaten in her own home, 
almost died from a rare form of malaria and suffered many instances of theft on her farm. And she had to contend with severe weather conditions. And yet, her faith in God never wavered. I think Margaret, being such a nature girl, was very dependent on the God who was the only one who could control the viciousness of nature, the devastation of storms and hail and thunder and lightning, who could temper the drought that beset her on this hillside so very often. On the many Christmases where she would spend watering plant by plant by plant, and she used to sometimes have discussions with God about this and scold God in no uncertain terms about not looking after her. I remember her saying, well, doesn't the church pray about this drought? And it, she had a relationship that was very personal. It was she and God were sorting the, the world out. And she had a direct line. And from there flowed everything else. Her foundation is Anglican. And in our Anglican way, it is rather strict in the way that you go on your knees and you pray. And I feel that, and I find it now myself, and I, I hear my mum's words through my mind, when she says, darling, when the world is so tough and life knocks you to your knees, get on them and pray. And I believe that absolutely wholly because in her way of her upbringing with her Anglican background, she only had the Anglican background as a base, but her spirituality grew so much more in the years. And working with plants, you have a very wide spirituality. You find that the plants and the, the earth talks to you. And in this way, you accept so much more that people give you in these spiritual ways. When Margaret moved here, um, and indeed beforehand as well, she immediately built chapels. And every single day, she used to put flowers in the chapel, and it's to be witnessed even now, and she would pray in that chapel. The chapel is the most amazing place. It is very small, it only houses 12 seats, so it is tiny. We have so many beautiful ceremonies in there, and it was one of Margaret's favorite places. We don't really have time to get to a church, and having the chapel on the farm was always a sanctuary. We've built it in an area that has almost a pillar of light. So when you go into the chapel, the light is not only beautiful from the outside coming through the stained glass windows, but it is beautiful inside and you feel it. And she always used to feel it was a place of healing. Mum did all the beautiful prayers, and there were some of those that were her favourites that are on the walls in the chapel, as well as her own animals' prayers. And in the centre, as you come in, I did the stained glass windows with the cross, as we are Christian. Um, we believe that anyone is welcome into that chapel, although we do have so many people from different walks. We have the Buddhists walking the labyrinth, and we have the sacred ash from the Red Indians, and we have so much more and so much spirituality that it feels as if it is a wave or a drip in the ocean that has a ripple effect on people as they drive in. More than a hundred different plants are mentioned in the Bible, 
and many of them grow happily in the gardens of the Herbal Center. Before her passing, we asked Margaret to talk about some of her favorites. I was hard pressed to select the ones that I think are the most important. And you know, if you really begin with things like the carob tree with John the Baptist, and you know about these wonderful natural chocolate pods, and you realize that today we are eating carob powder in this um, incredible array of healthy sweets or healthy puddings or healthy natural chocolate. And you wonder about John the Baptist as he was there in the desert using the plants that were available in order to survive all those long days and nights that he was there. And they talk of the locust tree and many historians believe it happens to be this the carob tree. So mom found inspiration by tying her knowledge of herbs to what she had read in the Bible. And from this knowledge, she would go back and say, if we can be simple in the way we look at plants, you'll be able to find your answers in the Bible. The hollyhock is native to China. It is an amazing plant and it has spread throughout the world in its abundance of seed that have been part of a great trade. What is so exciting about it is that its five petals indicate to man its food and its medicine. Crushed petals used on sores and wounds with the blessing of those five petals healed them, the Chinese thought, miraculously. And today we are finding that miraculous healing. It decorated shrines, it decorated statues, especially the Virgin Mary, and circling the globe, this plant has become one of the most particular plants that we need to grow in our gardens. The elderberry is also mentioned in the Bible, and Margaret would say that it may have been cultivated much earlier by prehistoric man. Hippocrates, the ancient Greek known as the father of medicine, described the plant as his medicine chest because of the wide array of health concerns it seemed to cure. This became one of the most wonderful cleansing herbs which the priests cleansed themselves with in this water and also did a drink of elderberry and lemon. So the first lemonade became something terribly important using honey with it. So the drink which they gave to the children at the churches, the elderberry or elderflower with lemon juice. So it became one of the first almost holy drinks. And after they had had um, a service, they had a place where they gave refreshment to the people before they left to go on their homeward journey. I remember fairly recently going into a church in Kenya and finding to my absolute delight that there was a small bouquet placed upon the altar. It was tied up with palm leaves and it had little white flowers. The little white flowers are pyrethrum and I loved the thought that it was important enough to put that there for thanksgiving, for the crop that was going to be so great a success. I saw that it was planted with sesame, and sesame is another one of the ancient herbs that has been used not only for medicine, but for religion in thanksgiving. So pyrethrum plays a very big role. The other plant that I loved so much is costmary. It's a beautiful, soft, almost minty plant that is used, those leaves are pressed in a Bible. And these were supposed to keep the person who owned the Bible awake during a long and tedious sermon, or it was used to, the smell of it, to allay the hunger pangs that would take them through the Sunday morning if the service went on and on. 
but cost Mary is also known as by belief. And so this would mark the page of an important passage within the Bible. Mum loved the Bible plants and in her sayings and her poetry, because she wrote beautiful poetry, she always wrote about what a rose would mean. And in the Doctrine of Signatures, she would talk about the devotion that lavender meant. And, and I think that really is what Mum was. She was the lavender lady and she inspired people with words. And those words were the foundation of the Bible. Now, well, I love the thought of lavender coming in because it means to wash, lavare, is where it gets its name. And all the lavenders were grown outside the churches, often on the way to the church, so that you would be able to pick those plants, perhaps rub them in your hands, have that fresh and wonderful smell. So don't think that the, the posy of lavender standing at the altar was there just for its beauty. No, it was there for its cleansing action. Fennel became also a cleansing herb and those were planted around the churches because it was taken as a cleansing herb. And I love the idea of fennel, which is used still today in cleansing salads and probably its seeds in the religious ceremonies. So that becomes a very important plant to grow near a place of worship. Also, let us never forget one of the most important of all the holy herbs is the holy basil. Her trials for the thyme, rosemary and mint collections and for the many basils, resulted in a range of new plant varieties which she named and propagated, giving South Africans a unique chance at growing what she referred to as plant jewels. Basil is one of the most rewarding plants to grow in the garden. Not only is it one of the best detoxifiers that the body has, and it can be made into a pleasant tea, but it also draws wonderful things like butterflies and bees to the garden, which are so much needed. The part of basil that is so interesting is this, that it was used in embalming purposes and also as a herb of blessing for the departed. So during the time of a funeral, people would bring basil in the days gone by and they would leave it around the coffin to be burned later, the ashes scattered upon the coffin. I love the idea that it is used in one of these beautifully necessary ways of saying goodbye to the dead, as well as that, to be able to use it as a health building wellness herb. And so we should be adding basil to our diet every day of our lives. Formalized herbal medicine was developed in the early Middle Ages as a component of medieval medical treatments. It was central to the practice of monastic medicine. The gardens surrounding monasteries contained a wide array of plants cultivated specifically for their healing properties. The mint, which came with the cumin and the coriander and which was used as tithes, that is mentioned in the Bible. Did we realize the value of mint? No. We didn't, but the monks in the cloister gardens did. They remembered that just a few leaves, a sprig of mint into a cup of boiling water, let it stand for five minutes, and you will see this wonderful relaxation that comes from sipping the water of mint. Then we come to an amazing story, and this is one I really love. It's the story of the grenadilla. The grenadilla made into a drink, sweetened with honey, was to calm and soothe the people who had been there and had witnessed the terrible crucifixion. And I often think of whenever I taste the grenadilla that we should pause in that moment 
and just give thanks and remembrance. That flower depicts the passion of Christ. That's why it's called the passion fruit or the passion flower. So the idea is this, that you would be able to look at that entire flower and you would see within it the story of the Christ and his crucifixion. There are 10 white petals that surround it. The white petals are the 10 disciples, excluding Peter who denied him and Judas who betrayed him. In the very center are the three huge antlers of the stigma, style and ovary. That is the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit. Underneath it are five stamens, those are the five wounds. Below that is the purple corolla, which is considered to be the crown of thorns stained with the Christ's blood. And it's always that purple color. The part that I love so much with the leaves is that it is giving you the hands of the perpetrators. So it's the fingers of those that clutched at him. The twists of, of vine, those depict the lashings that he got from the whips and where the leaves grow on the plant singly on a stem denotes the aloneness of Christ and the journey we all have in our own aloneness to that final oneness with God. introduction of a rather strange and unusual plant that very few people know. It's called buckwheat. The producers of this program knew Margaret for more than 30 years. Their first shoot with her took place in 1983, and over the next 20 years, she was featured on TV as a regular guest on Gardens Wild and Wonderful in a segment called Plants with a Purpose, Herb of the Week on Good Morning South Africa, and with South Africa's Mr. Gardening, Keith Kirsten. You start off with this world of chilies in gentleness. Do take care because, of course, it is extremely hot. There are ways of using so many of them, and most people experiment to get their own tastes. Margaret was larger than life. Um, I've known her for so many years, uh, first buying beautiful pottery from her that she made out on their farm out in the Michalisburg near Rustenburg, and, uh, and that was before the Herbal Center. And then I, th I think it was around 1983 that we actually filmed her on her very first gardening program when she came on to my Dig This program in the very, very early days. And that was her debut into television. And she put herbs on the map. I mean, she made people realize also the value of our native or indigenous herbs. Um, so many of them, and here they are at the Herbal Center. She, as you know, has just really um, got so many different herbs that she's introduced to the marketplace for gardeners. And those are her legacy. Um, and I think she leaves an amazing legacy for South African gardeners and South Africans at large. It was these soft, beautiful leaf tips that were used like that, cut off there and lightly steamed, tendrils and all, that were given to those shipbuilders in ancient times to give them energy and vitality. You have to have a carrot. It stops any of the bubble and stuff. Margaret was also a guest on many radio programs and her monthly lectures were always fully booked well ahead of time. She used to love talking about plants. I think it's easy to talk about your favorite subject. And she was such an amazing lecturer that she would really make someone who didn't know about herbs understand very easily and want to go and plant them. So her background of public speaking is enormous and she's had this way with speaking on the farm or at launches or in front of people. It didn't matter if it was to you personally, one person, or to a room of a thousand people. So you see it in just twice the height of it, no more, into the moist soil. I started coming through to her monthly lecture and every month I would buy a few more plants, a few more plants, <laughs> and started building up my pharmacy at home. 
and the benefit to me has been tremendous to my family. Yeah, this is my seventh year. In fact, I just finished 52 uh, lessons with her. And basically every lesson is unique and different. You know, sometimes little similarities here and there, but basically everyone is different. And I mean, she's an ocean of knowledge. <laughs> yeah. We love coming here on a Saturday and we can always go home with a new plant or a new herb that we can experience in our own lives and in our own families and um, to share with the people we work with. I was just a really bad eater and I found that Margaret's lectures have taught me to eat a lot better and she's um, given me a different way of thinking about food altogether. Most inspirational person I've ever met in my life, I think. Margaret seemed to have endless energy. When the producers of her TV programs were filming with her, they had to beg her to take breaks. By the end of a long day, they were exhausted. But she kept on going. She was the picture of health, never wore glasses, and was living proof of her health philosophy. But she also needed some alone time. The labyrinth was her favorite place to escape to. The labyrinth was the first labyrinth to be built in the southern hemisphere many years ago and um, our labyrinth was the design from the Chartres Cathedral in France which is the classic design and it has convolutions that come back and forth and so as you walk it you need to have time. The principle of the labyrinth is so that if you do walk it you find that your mind unfuzzles and you become straight in the way you think and the answers will come to you. Margaret Roberts was perhaps best known for her books. Mum started her books very early on. She hand wrote little books and in fact I've got the first book from the first farm that she wrote about the cattle walking and in their footprints in the clay. She wrote and published more than 40 books. The updated version of the bestseller, Indigenous Healing Plants, written together with daughter Sandy, was released in early 2017. Sadly, she passed away before the official launch on the 1st of July. Sandy says there are two more books in the pipeline. Each book is completely different. It has got information that goes all the way through from the classic herbs to our indigenous heritage in South Africa. And she had so much knowledge that she wanted to bring through that she was writing a few books simultaneously. And this is how the knowledge could come through. One day we were talking about the process of prayer and I was recounting how as a priest I go into prayer and the different stages of prayer and, and relationship and comfort and sustenance that I drew. And she said, my love, that is exactly what writing is all about. She said, where do you think the writing came from? Where do you think the poems came from? She said, that's not mine. She said, I sometimes look at them and wonder whether I wrote them. And she said, it wasn't me writing them. And so I could see that Margaret was on a very deep spiritual journey. In earlier times, female healers were often treated with suspicion and even persecution. This was no different for Dorothea, the patron saint of gardeners.
on the walkway close to the restaurant is Dorothea. And Dorothea is one of those statues that mom just loved. Dorothea means God's gift. And mom always felt that she had to feed Dorothea with the most beautiful flowers, either in around her neck or in her hair or in her basket as she held it because it meant for her abundance and it meant for her for always having the harvest. Taking inspiration from Dorothea's story, Margaret built a quirky apothecary room to honor the profession of natural healing. With its antiquated potion bottles and vintage medical paraphernalia, visitors are transported to a bygone era. So Margaret was a modern day alchemist. She did mix all of her creams and her lotions from her apothecary. It houses all the old equipment. Um, it is now a museum on the farm. Although we like to do our, our creams and our lotions differently, it is now not viable to do them the way we used to do them. So anybody is welcome to come to the apothecary and to see how Margaret began. Concerned that the world's food resources were under threat from climate change, Margaret and Sandy built South Africa's first seed bank in May 2005. They collected the best non-genetically modified seeds they could find, hermetically sealed them and locked them in the fireproof vault. The idea is to open it again in 2025 to see how well the seeds will germinate. The positive part about having worked with mom for so many years is that it's hard not to let it wash right through you. And when I say this is there is so much information to still bring out there to the public and there is so much written and so much we had planned because her, t her passing was untimely. It should not have happened so soon with the amount of work that we had planned ahead that I feel that my role is, is to pass this on so that each and every person loves what we have done, lives what we have done and finds the magic in where we are going. And she brings a little magic to the children too. Once a year, Sandy invites families to an enchanting fairy day. Children and mothers don fairy costumes to share a few hours of fun and inspiration, all carefully constructed to engender a deep sense of passion and goodness for Mother Earth. The children are encouraged to join in on the treasure hunt and wander through the fairy gallery. The fairy gallery was put together from many exhibitions that we did with fairies and the fairies were really there as little plant divas and why Margaret and I actually decided to do it was we found that the plants were so beautiful, why not have the fairy with it? And this would bring a little bit of fun and magic to children to understanding how to start their little fairy gardens. Every day um, we have a little girl or a little boy that comes in and says, if I plant a little plant like this, do you think the fairies would like it? Or will I get a bit of magic in my life? And so we love the positivity around the fairies. One of the highlights of a visit to the centre is lunch in the restaurant. Sandy's original recipes, using only natural organic ingredients, were developed over a lifetime of learning from her mom. So the restaurant has an interesting beginning because as I grew up from four I was cooking and we had this beautiful little herb garden so it was easy for me just to go into the little herb garden and pick little bunches of thyme and rosemary and sage and then come in and put them into the pot with mum. So for many years we cooked together and when I opened up the restaurant it was a natural progression going straight back to my roots of how I'd grown up. And using all the beautiful plants in the herbal dishes was one of those things that I found would expand on the knowledge 
that we had brought forward. The garden in front of the restaurant uh, was, was built specifically in the idea of having anything that was freshly picked to be served on your plate immediately, organically grown, nothing but. And the exciting part about having all of those herbs at your fingertips is, is it expands the idea of having a simple dish made into something quite exquisite, but having the healing properties with it. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. On the 4th of March 2017, the country was stunned to learn that South Africa's favorite herb lady had passed away after a short illness. Within hours, messages of condolence came pouring in. The announcement on Sandy's Facebook page was shared over 4,000 times within just 24 hours. A week later, her friends and family came together to remember her and show their appreciation for her contribution to the people of South Africa. Thank you for being with us this morning. Thank you for sharing this special day. And thank you for being part of our lives at the Herbal Center. Having each one of you here has a special place in each of our hearts. My mom is one of these people that was able to understand the differences and the uniquenesses of every person. For those of you who have had direct contact with her over the years, you will have known this is one of her fine qualities. I want you to know that I know that my mom was a legend. She was for me a legend and I know for many of you. I think it's a good time to reflect and look at her life and see how she lived a full, wholesome life and to try and use some of her attributes that she passed over to us to try and enrich our own lives. So today is also a celebration in a way, although a sad celebration. The memorial will never end. It will continue with Mom here in our presence and in our hearts. I feel that when I do describe mom, that she was really inspired by a higher source. And I always feel that that energy came from not only the plants that were behind her, but, and, and in the foundation of her very being. But she really drew on um, an inspiration that is far beyond a normal human being's inspiration. She was really the light that drove it all. She felt that the world was a big place and she felt that the incredible creation around us was just indicative of a loving presence or a, um, an, an intelligent love, if you like, that just brought life into everything and it was far bigger than we could conceptualize. And she kept bringing it back to us as children. She'd say to us that we have the God creation within us and we have everything that we need in order to be anything that we set our minds to. I do miss her. She wasn't just a granny to me, she was also a teacher and a friend. And um, mom was sick when I was a baby and so I spent a lot of time with her. And so she was almost like a, a second mother to me. Well, not so much second, but in the same line as my mom. Margaret's actions, words, um, records, 
intentions are universal. I would almost actually say cosmic because Margaret was in touch with the divine, however you might like to define that. And many of her actions fl flowed straight out of that. So the word enthusiasm means God within. Margaret carried God within. I find that when I look out at the gardens and I'm on the farm, I find mom all around us and I realize how very strong the spirituality is and how connected we are. And we've had amazing conversations, mom and I always, about spirituality and what connects us. And I think the most wonderful part is she would always say, I'm more connected to you from the other side than I am here. And I think we need to remember that in our lives, to being connected to those that we've loved and that have passed before us, and remember the good. The medieval physician and philosopher Paracelsus said, God grows a plant for every disease. Look around nature and draw from God's pharmacy. Margaret understood and practiced this philosophy perhaps better than anyone else in South Africa. The thing that to me has become more important in my work with plants is that they're not just medicine. They're not just food. They are both, and they're a trinity, a third one with them. They are used hugely in thanksgiving and in religion. Let's think about that because it's not just for remembrance and it's not just for the uh, amazement that we have that it could have come so, so far, but it is for the faith that they had in these precious plants. And I think that's one of the most exciting parts of this whole work on plants.